societies, or the CSHF, Canada's Voice for Animal Welfare. And today I'd like to welcome you to the third and last webinar in conjunction with the CFHS's Accessible Spay Neuter Project. So for those of you who are not aware of this project, I invite you to visit our website, cfhs.ca, and click on Animals in the Home, and then Accessible Spay Neuter, where you will find a suite of tools to help individuals and organizations across Canada to both advocate for and implement accessible sterilization services for companion animals in your communities. So as part of this project, we've been hosting webinars throughout the fall of 2014 to highlight real-world initiatives that are increasing accessible spay-neuter rates here in Canada. They're examples where organizations have taken best practices about how to implement accessible programs and tailored them to the particular geographic and sociocultural context of their communities. So some of the previous webinars that we've presented have been by the BC SPCA and by the Alberta Spay Neuter Task Force. You can view recordings of those webinars on the Accessible Spay Neuter website. And in addition, I'll let you know that today's recording or today's webinar will also be recorded and you'll be able to view that one again should you wish to go back um, down the road or if you want to pass that information on to colleagues who weren't able to make it today. So now I'm excited to introduce the presenters of today's webinar, Ati Innocente and Dr. Leanne Seeley from Kitchener-Waterloo Humane Society. Ms. Kathy Innocente is the Animal Care Manager at Kitchener-Waterloo Humane Society. She has 23 years of experience working in the animal welfare field and not-for-profit sector with a background in fundraising and leadership management. Kathy is responsible for system-wide functions that ensure the health and well-being of animals that come under the care of the Kitchener-Waterloo Humane Society. She spent over 15 years working closely with a veterinary team on shelter medicine issues and continues to identify and resolve ongoing challenges faced by a facility that cares for more than 5,000 animals every year. Dr. Leanne Seeley graduated from the University of Guelph, Ontario Veterinary College in 1993 and has been the owner of the Romeo Pet Hospital, a companion animal hospital, since 1997. In 2013, Dr. Seeley began working in shelter medicine when her clinic became the veterinary partner with her local shelter. In 2014, Dr. Seeley was brought on to consult and assist with the opening of the Kitchener-Waterloo Humane Society Animal Hospital within the center. She then became the clinic director for the hospital, providing medical care and surgery of all types, including spay and neuter for the animals of Kitchener-Waterloo Humane Society. Dr. Seeley continues to work with her local shelter. She lives in Stratford, Ontario, along with her husband, two daughters, and she says two wild and crazy terriers and the family gecko. So just before I turn it over to uh, Kathy and Leanne, I will just mention that all of the participants who are in the audience for today's webinar will be on mute in order to enhance the listening um, experience for all participants. So we're just making sure that none of the background no noise comes through. And if anybody has questions that they wish to pose to the presenters, you can use the question function in the webinar menu to type in questions. And we'll hold all of those until the end of the presentation at which time uh, one of the organizers will read out the questions one at a time and uh, your presenters will be able to answer. So uh, do jot down your questions as we go, but uh, the answers will be coming towards the end of the presentation. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Ms. Kathy Innocente and Dr. Leanne Seeley, who will be speaking about community collaborations for the advancement of accessible spay neuter. Well, hi, everyone. Um, we're, Leanne and I are very pleased today to be able to uh, present this to you on some of our experiences here in the Kitchener and Waterloo area. Um, we hope we can um, give you a little background in some of the challenges we faced. Um, I think uh, what we're pretty excited to share with you is um, I can bring a, a shelter kind of feel to things, and Leanne is going to share with you a veterinary perspective, which uh, sometimes uh, it, it's tough to get that uh, view and so I think it, it'll, it'll be a really great uh, webinar and we're looking forward to answering any questions at the end. 
Um, just to give you a little background uh, before we begin on um, the Kitchener, Waterloo and Stratford Humane Society. Uh, in tw 2012, uh, we formed a new organization called uh, the Animal Welfare Agency of South Central Ontario. We call it a WASCO. And this new organization represents the coming together of the Stratford Perth Humane Society and the Kitchener Waterloo Humane Society. Um, it, at that time, the OSPCA uh, was running the Stratford Shelter and um, they were looking at different management and we kind of came forward at that time and thought that we could assist um, knowing that there were some struggles within the Stratford community and um, thought we could help them kind of move forward in the animal welfare field. So we wanted to enhance their operational capacities, financial viability, educational opportunities, um, just overall for the Stratford uh, Perth community. So a little bit about, the, I'll go through Kitchener and Stratford. So a little about Kitchener Humane Society. Uh, we were founded here in 1927, and you can see a picture there of that small little barn on the left. And we've got an example here of our first vehicle and our first inspector, um, which was John McKay, and his starting salary was $15 a month. Uh, we are currently an 18,000 square foot facility, and we have a 2,000 square foot off-site education center. Uh, that education center uh, does offer dog training. We have doggy daycare that runs five days a week. We do children's birthday parties, uh, children's programs and camps. Um, so it's a very, very busy education center off-site, and it uh, actually helps us to run more programming, which um, we're very proud to say our education programs are very, um, uh, we reach over 36,000 students a year here in KW, so we're very proud of that. And we're working on uh, increasing those numbers in the Stratford area. Right now, we can accommodate approximately 65 dogs, 225 cats, and an assortment of birds, small mammals, and reptiles. Now, that 225 cats, uh, I think most uh, shelters and humane societies and a lot of organizations can uh, appreciate that. That definitely can swell in the summer months, and we do see that, uh, that increase uh, quite high, sometimes in August and September. Um, we can uh, house 500 animals in emergency situations if need be. We currently have approximately 800 pets that are uh, fostered off-site through our foster program each year, and obviously that helps with our capacity because uh, it does get so high. And right now, um, currently with wildlife, we've got in there, we're seeing over 7,000 animals come through the doors each year. Um, another thing that um, Owasco has instituted between Stratford and KW facilities is uh, we do realize a 90% live release rate that uh, we instituted this new philosophy a couple of years ago, so we're really proud of that. Um, a lot of hard work, but it's been very successful. And obviously our veterinary assistance comes from our on-site animal hospital. Um, we also do have uh, cat colonies, which you can see from the middle photograph there. We have a couple of blast-in cat colonies as well. Um, we did uh, incorporate three large and three small colonies uh, a couple of years ago as well to help us with our capacity, and that's uh, been going very well as well. The Stratford Perth Humane Society is located in Stratford, obviously. Um, it opened in April of 1989, and that followed a community fundraising drive from some community members. The previous shelter um, was only open to cats, so uh, there was an issue with where dogs were going to go. So the current building is approximately 1,100 square feet, and it can accommodate up to 70 animals, and that's, that's really stretching in. Um, the current shelter, um, it's reaching its end of its ser serviceable life. It doesn't meet the growing needs of Stratford. Uh, the kennels are overcrowded. You see on the, on the right photograph, that's actually basement kennels for stray dogs. Um, not very inviting. Um, it's just not a community place where a community wants to go. So we're looking to make a change in that direction. Uh, the Stratford Perth Humane Society is currently in a capital campaign mode. It's underway. Um, and we're looking to raise funds for the new State of the Art, uh, Art Animal Welfare Center. So in keeping with our philosophy that every animal deserves a chance, um, the new 8,000 8, square foot center um, will offer a lot of the programs and mirror what we do here in KW. So the sh uh, dog areas will be bright and have uh, natural light, uh, better care for the cats. Right now they're stressed. Um, the housing is not really appropriate. They are crowded and noisy. Um, we'll have beautiful colonies, nice open areas, and it'll be very welcoming to the community. Um, humane education programs, um, children's camps and meetings will also have uh, be done on site. And again, that will help us with revenue within the Stratford area. Um, also the intake uh, facility will provide space for on-site emergency care, 
And it's just all around improved processing, general health for the animals. Um, it's just going to be a really uh, community center that we can welcome animals and people. And um, yeah, we can, they can just do a better job altogether. So um, getting right to the accessible spay and neuter. Um, this first slide, when I say accessible spay and neuter starts at home, really made me sit down and think, um, before the inception of our uh, uh, clinic on site, we always looked at um, how accessible was spay and neuter to our center. I mean, um, we put out over 3,000 animals into adoption every year. And that got to me to thinking about um, we didn't have accessible spay neuter for ourselves. So um, to let you know what that looked like, um, we were, up till three years ago, we're still in the voucher system for spaying and neutering. And I know a lot of uh, shelters are very familiar with that. Um, that wasn't good enough. We found that uh, after looking at statistics, only 90% um, compliance rate of the use for that, those vouchers. So that leaves 10% of those animals that were leaving the center were not spayed or neutered. So um, that just wasn't good enough for us. So we had to look at um, how could we do it better. So then we moved to using community veterinarians to assist us with our spaying neutering needs. Again, this still wasn't an ideal uh, with 3,000 plus surgeries a year. Um, we really found it hard um, to work with the veterinarians within our community for scheduling. And we very often were still looking at only 90% of the animals leaving here were spayed and neutered. And again, um, that still wasn't um, good enough for us. We needed to get to that 100%. So um, we also still had to worry about costly surgeries for things like amputations or, or anything else that an animal needed. With working with community veterinarians, it left us very limited um, as our finances uh, you know, couldn't help with the strain of that. So we found we were still in the position where we had to pick and choose which animals were, were going to receive that surgery due to age or whatever the case may be. So we wanted to remove those barriers as best we could. So um, then we started to look at what are our, our current surgical needs? Well, did we need a clinic on site? Did it make sense? And then we looked at that. We thought, can it be done? So um, we here in KW uh, kind of flew by the seat of our pants. Um, we knew and that when we identified that it needed to be done, we wanted it done right away. Um, our costs were fairly high in veterinary care um, with working with the community veterinarians. Um, and we didn't want to lose that quality of care either when we considered putting a shelter in. Um, we also had to look at CBO regulations um, here in Ontario. Were we able to do that? Um, what were our barriers to doing that as well? So there was a lot of stuff that we really had to look at. So our first step was to ask for help uh, because that's what other people are there for. I found in the animal welfare field that uh, why reinvent the wheel? Other people are doing it and everyone's very happy to share what they've done in their successes. And we thought, um, let's reach out to other organizations. And we did that. We contacted the Nova Scotia SPCA who had uh, currently a clinic on site. And we worked very closely with them and we actually brought them down uh, to the KW Center and uh, had them talk to us about um, how they did things and what worked for them and what didn't. So it actually helped us to move forward because we knew uh, some of the things that we were going to run into and we could anticipate things ahead of time. Um, so uh, that was very successful in having them come in. Um, there are also grants available um, for those people. Um, unlike us, we kind of moved into things very quickly. Um, PetSmart Charities has some fantastic funding available if you're looking at putting in uh, your own uh, clinic for, for care for your animals in your centers. So we put the we put this clinic in and then uh, we looked at things and, and then we had to assess what the community needs are. Um, and we thought, what are the needs and how can we assist? Um, and that was pretty hard for us to do because up till then we've been worrying only about the needs within the center. Um, and actually, I just want to jump back one little bit second. Um, when we um, put the clinic in place, I just want to mention that uh, we did bring on uh, Leanne as our uh, consultant to help us with the clinic. Uh, what better person to help you put a clinic in place and, and work with builders and the CBO accreditation and all the needs than a veterinarian who's done it a couple of times. So she was fantastic in, uh, in doing a lot of hand-holding with me and a lot of hand-holding with the organization. And I don't think we would have been able to really put it together as seamlessly and easily as it seemed, um, although there was uh, definitely issues. Leanne's laughing beside me. Um, but it, it went a lot better than I anticipated, so it w went really well. So as far as um, looking at the needs of the communities, um, we knew there were organizations out there. 
um, that didn't have access to spay neuter services. Here in KW, the closest uh, spay neuter or accessible spay neuter clinic is in London, which is over an hour away from those within the KW area. Um, so for them, that is not accessible. So we thought, how can we help assist them in what they need to do? Um, plus, we wanted to share our resources. So we wanted to look at what role will what our clinic play in accessible spay neuter. Um, so we wanted to identify partnerships um, within that, um, with the stuff we were looking for spaying neuter. So we looked at uh, dealing with rescue organizations and trap neuter return. Now, um, we never, we didn't have any experience or programs dealing with TNR um, in the history of the, the KW Humane Society. So that was a little tough for us kind of looking at um, how would we start um, and how will we get the groups together. Uh, we have always had challenges, and I think, uh, um, and I'm not saying a lot of organizations do, but I, say, I think some can appreciate that there are challenges when you form uh, new relationships and new partnerships with rescue organizations, um, and we need to get those groups to come together, and we knew that that would be the, really tricky uh, for us to, to look at that. So, and uh, in the past, we had faced challenges over the last year uh, with mistrust being the top issue. And I think that was basically on, um, I think it's a lot of that is to do with the unknown and everybody's processes are different, but we had to remember that the bottom line is the same. So we wanted to also partner with groups um, that we wanted to look at that had a, a list of best practices um, that were doing things um, right within the community as well and were kind of aligned with what we were looking at. So we knew we had to put that together, um, a list of those best practices to um, kind of combat at the beginning so we, we could get rid of that uh, mistrust because that, we knew that would always be there um, according to past history. Um, so as I said, we wanted to make sure that the rescue organizations we partnered with had their own best practices in place, so proper timely vet care was important, um, a good community reputation, sound adoption program, and a really good network of fosters and volunteers because um, most organizations in Humane Size, I think we can all agree that volunteers uh, volunteers play a key role in what we do, so we need to know that um, you know with assisting any TNR rescue organizations that they had that support as well. Uh, we also had to realize that everyone had to leave their ego at the door. Um, it wasn't about who was doing anything better because we were all doing the best we could, and it was all about how we could help each other achieve the goals that we were looking for. Now here in KW, we're very very lucky in that we've. Uh, had a, an individual in the KW area who actually approached us about actual funding for TNR and rescue organizations. And this is a, a, a wonderful couple who's retired. They actually put up a six-figure uh, um, donation that is allowing us to conduct these surgeries and everything's paid for. And it's over the next year. So obviously you can imagine how um, happy the the uh, uh, TNR and the rescue organizations were when they found that uh, there was going to be no cost involved, and we were happy to take that on. Uh, the challenges in doing with that is when you have 3,000 plus animals to spay and neuter and surgeries and to do uh, wellness exams on for in, in a shelter of this size is uh, when are you going to do TNR? So that was something that uh, Leanne and I talked long and hard about. and and. Um, we are doing it. It started on uh, the first week of November, and it's 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 going great. It's going okay. Um, it is coming up to winter months, so we're going to have to reevaluate when we can continue to do that in the spring and summer season. Currently, we do uh, we set aside a Wednesday to do TNR, and we're doing approximately 20 surgeries every Wednesday. So, um, again, something that we'll constantly reevaluate and look at changing if we can. But we are dedicated to trying to do at least 1,000 um, surgeries for these rescue organizations in the next 12 months. So um, that will we'll keep, as I said, reevaluating and looking at that. Now, subsidized spay and neuter, uh, KW and, uh, or sorry, OWASCO, our philosophy uh, that we look at is we want to ensure that when we're offering subsidized spay and neuter, these are usually for uh, folks who are on social assistance. So they are receiving this monies um, to support the individuals and their families. So that money is used for rent and, and food and whatnot. And we don't feel um, as a charity that we should be taking that money that is already subsidized dollars um, for their care of their family for saving or so. With us, what subsidized we'll be looking at will be either fully or partially subsidized staying or neuter services for them. Um, I do realize that um, that may differ from a lot of organizations 
where they just want to open the door and allow anyone to come in and utilize those uh, subsidized state need of services, regardless of income or whatnot. So um, we do differ a little bit in that way, and it was a little bit of a concern at the beginning. Would that make a difference um, when we were kind of narrowing that down? And we have found that um, there's a number of organizations. Um, uh, Regina Humane Society actually offers fully and partially subsidized spay and neuter services, and they are targeted to low-income clients. And uh, anyone that's making over a certain income cannot use the service. And they have actually found in a four-year time span that they receive 17% 17, 17 fewer animals are admitted to the shelter every year. So um, we do know that it will work, and because obviously the bottom line is we want our intakes to go down and our education to go up so that we have uh, people following that philosophy of spay neutering everything. So within that subsidized uh, spay neuter, we all will do means testing as well. So those who do come in and require that service will be asked to show proof of a T4 slip um, or some kind of documentation that will show us um, what their income is. And again, it'll be depending. Uh, it'll be on a case by case basis, um, depending on uh, the person's needs, whether they will even have to pay uh, zero dollars, ten dollars, or twenty dollars. So um, we're still looking at that right now because um, we're actually will be approaching PetSmart charities and looking at getting a grant to help us assist uh, with that area as well. So identifying again more partnerships, uh, we've actually looked at um, community outreach. So we are currently involved um, with uh, the HAVE Coalition, and that's a human-animal vulnerability coalition here in the KW area. There's a number of um, organizations that are involved as well, so ourselves, the KW Humane Society, Women's Crisis Services of Waterloo Region, Public Health, Family and Children's Aid Society, and Supporting Housing of Waterloo. So this group actually looks at how to assist uh, within the KW uh, community, Waterloo Region, um, on how to help uh, with pets um, that are in crisis. So this coalition also currently partners with a community vet outreach program, which is run twice per year here in the KW area. And that program um, actually offers help to uh, marginally housed or homeless individuals. So uh, they are run, and anyone can go and their pets are cared for and vaccinated and um, any issues are addressed with a veterinarian one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Now those individuals, um, as the humane say, we wanted to help them as well. So that was another part of our community we didn't want to overlook. So working closely with the community vet outreach, we now provide free of charge uh, spay neuter services for um, marginally housed or homeless individuals. They do come through the HAVE Coalition and the Vet Outreach Clinic, um, so we do work on a referral basis. So that has actually started uh, just recently as well, and it, and it is going fairly well. Um, we're still, um, at, as far as compliance goes, those that are involved with the, the uh, homeless individuals, um, as you can imagine, it's very difficult for them to get in contact with us or whatnot, so that in itself has been a wee bit of a challenge. Um, we're also looking at um, offering services um, surrounding humane societies. So we know that there's some humane societies in Waterloo Region that don't have a clinic on site. So what does that mean for them? Where, where do they access um, their spay neuter services? So we're looking at uh, can we offer to help them in any way? Um, and again, um, these, are, these are the things that we talk about fairly regularly. And, and um, Leanne, I, I think it gives her gray hairs, but um, we're, uh, you know, we're really looking to get out there. Uh, time is precious for us here with all the amount of surgeries that we have to offer. So it can make it tough, but we want to help where we can. Um, city partnerships. So we're very lucky here within KW. We do, um, our center does do the animal control. And within that animal control, we work very closely with the cities. So, um, um, now I'm just looking at a little thing there, Kim. Are we good? Everybody can still hear me? Okay, I'm going to assume that everything's yeah. fine. If every, I think everything's good on our end, so you can keep okay. going. Got a little pink right. box in the right corner. Okay. Um, so within the responsible pet ownership that we deal with with the city partnerships, they have actually put in our new contracts that um, we are contracted to actually um, take in stray uh, cats within the cities of Kitchener Waterloo. Now working closely with the cities, um, we've had to review their bylaws um, to realize that a lot of the cats that we were receiving here in the center 
were actually owned animals. So they were actually just cats uh, wandering around the neighborhood that people were picking up and bringing to us. So um, that caused a little bit of uh, issues for us uh, because uh, we were displacing pets in the home. And, and as we all know, a lot of owners didn't come to reclaim their, their cats. So it's just uh, another cat in the shelter and us trying to find a home. So it was really um, putting a lot of strain on our resources. So now with the new city partnerships, uh, the cities have agreed that when we have inquiries and people coming in to call to pick up a stray cat, uh, the way we've actually worked it now is that uh, we do encourage them to release the cat back outside, especially if it looks like it's a cat that is a home cat and it's in good shape, um, especially in uh, a lot of times they do even know where the cat lives. So um, they are releasing them back outside and then we are following up with the owners um, to do education, which is, is a key component for us um, as far as um, encouraging responsible pet ownership. Um, we're still looking at mandatory cat ID. Um, I know uh, BC has that in place and it's very successful. So that's something that we're still working with the cities for. Um, they also have, so we're looking at speed meter incentives. So what that looks like currently, um, it's very on a very small scale. If you purchase your dog tag and your ca uh, dog is spayed or neutered, um, we are currently, um, you do receive a $25 gift, certi gift certificate to an area pet store. So. Um, we're working with them on um, how those incentives can increase, um, what can the cities actually do to encourage owners to spay neuter their animals. So um, you can see it's, it's, when we say accessible, it's just more about, it's, it's not just about having a facility that provides that service, it's about working with partners and communities in your area to how, um, how you can better reach out and, and have that done and encourage and educate the community on how important that is. So I'm going to turn it over to Leanne, and she's going to talk with you about the vet perspective on uh, the spay meters. Thank you, Kathy. So for the next half of the webinar, I'm hoping to kind of pass on some thoughts on how to build partnerships with veterinarians in your community. Um, and I thought we would do this by discussing um, accessibility through the perspective of a veterinarian, and that would be myself. Um, and this is an insight that you may not have readily to hand, so I, I hope that the information I pass on to you lets you be able to um, share what, what kind of comes to our minds when we think accessibility and some of the barriers um, that we have when it comes to helping you with accessibility. Um, and that way at the end we'll all be able to understand each other a little bit better. So first off, let's look at the meaning of accessible spay-neuter, uh, because this is something that I think turns a lot of veterinarians' heads. The definition created by the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies is available to as many pet guardians as possible, and that's a very broad definition. And I think that's as it should be, given that there are so many multiple and geographic and demographic areas um, in Canada. There's no two regions that are going to share exactly the same concerns. So we can't really define accessible um, to one specific thing. However, I think the important thing to realize is that every community does have a different need for accessibility. And this may mean having a subsidized clinic that provides lower cost. It may mean a mobile clinic that can access a remote area. It may mean providing extra veterinary hours to a clinic that's there but already overwhelmed with need. And that's something that each community has to evaluate and not just open the door to the word accessible and, and not understand what your community really is looking for or needs. Sometimes the word subsidized is used uh, synonymously with accessible, and I think that that's a difficult term for veterinarians to wrap their heads around as well. Do they always mean the same thing? And I, I don't think that, that they do. Usually these two things go hand in hand. You know, subsidies may be provided by the community that's in need. It may be provided, as in some of our cases, by private donors, and that's to help keep costs lower. In larger centers, though, in southern Ontario, we are seeing uh, veterinarians who are starting to see the spay-neuter clinic as an alternative model to operating a clinic. And some of these veterinarians are doing this philanthropically, but I think we always need to recognize that others are actually providing a service which has a profit model. In the end, with either type, the communities benefit in the accessibility to spay-neuter um, as long as the care being provided in both systems is good. However, I think there are challenges because there might be different philosophies about need and cost when these two groups meet head on. Subsidizing can offset much of the costs associated with running a veterinary practice, especially when you're talking about startup revenue. Um, this subsidy, uh, if you are receiving subsidy, 
should be passed on to those in need of the service. Um, this is a problem that many veterinarians in Southern Ontario see happening. Because to us, subsidizing should allow the clinic to offer the spay and neuter at a price which would or should be very low to, or even free to those in need. Because to us, this addresses the need for accessibility in relation to cost barriers. However, just addressing cost barriers doesn't ex address the other definitions of accessibility. This goes back to does subsidize really equal accessible. Um, in, uh, uh, in this respect, a subsidized clinic may still not be accessible. For example, if there's long wait times or the clinic is in a poor location for those who really need it. It doesn't matter how much it doesn't cost. Another concern with accessibility occurs um, to veterinarians, at least when we see it, and I think it's, it's true in Southern Ontario, um, when a clinic allows the general public to use, their, use that accessibility, um, and we must always be really cautious of the misuse of the subsidized system. I think that when a donor donates money to a subsidized clinic, they expect the money to be used to help those in need, not those who just want to do things cheaper. And I think it's really important to have access to the system when the people who need the system really are there to use it. And we'll talk about that in a minute here. Um, so continuing on the thoughts of what we sometimes see as barriers to accessibility, um, let's review some of those um, that maybe you haven't thought about and veterinarians see as a barrier to providing accessibility. And the first one is the provincial regulations. And provincial regulations we're going to talk about on a separate slide, but they do keep our costs higher, and they really can impede um, the use of remote location services, and that's definitely a problem in Ontario. We also see misuse of the system, and misuse of the system um, in terms of providing accessibility, I, I have seen this, heard this happening, that it can cause very long wait times for those in need. And when some people who are on lower incomes or socioeconomic difficulties when they're told that they have to wait, they may think that it's not important to spay or neuter their pet if they have to wait. And they may develop a kind of a why bother attitude if I keep getting told I can't get an appointment. The delaying of timely service for these people can perpetuate the, the litter cycle quite readily by these people um, having their pets get pregnant during the wait time and then, of course, having to cancel their spay or neuter appointment and then have a litter, nurse the litter, and then try to book another appointment, which then gets put off for another six or seven months, and in the meantime, we now have another litter, and this doesn't certainly help anybody in the accessibility. I think also um, there's a, a lack of education for the public, and if we just open our doors with an accessible clinic um, and, and tell people that we are offering sprays and neuters, it doesn't make them really understand why it's important to spay or neuter, and we're all too familiar with uh, that you can offer, but that doesn't make them come kind of philosophy. So anytime we talk about accessibility, it's really important to talk about education to the public on this. And that's a role that veterinarians have played for a long time and um, feel that sometimes um, providing accessibility without education doesn't really work. And finally, I think your biggest barrier you might find in your community might be a general lack of veterinary support. And um, my position here today is to try to tell you that this can be a multifold issue. And this can include things like there not just not being enough veterinarians to work at your clinic. The veterinarians who are willing to help you may not have the skills that you need. And there just may be a general lack of interest in supporting your cause, which again, I'm going to expand on in a little bit to maybe help you get some idea of where veterinarians might be coming from on this so that we can all work together better. Kitchener Water and Humane Society was an easy fit for myself. They made it really easy to come on board. Their definition of accessibility fit really well into my vision as an Ontario veterinarian of where we needed to help people. Accessible in my mind and Kitchener's mind has been, I um, already talked to uh, you about Kathy with Kathy, but mostly we're looking at socioeconomic factors as the barrier to accessibility in our region. People who just don't have the good fortune to afford to get their animals spayed or neutered. And as well, these charitable, group, charitable groups who are struggling to deal with the overpopulation problems and have a very, very small budget in trying to do that. So moving on, I mentioned that we would talk a little bit about provincial regulations. I think this is something that, that unless you're a veterinarian, you really can't get a hold on. And um, I'd like to take a minute to explain some things to you, because this is where veterinarians might have trouble helping you out. The first thing to say is that you need to understand that provincial associations, whether it be the College of Veterinarians of Ontario or the College of Veterinarians of British Columbia or so on, 
those groups are there to protect the public. And that's not something people realize. They think that those groups are there for the veterinarians, but they're not. These are the groups that allow us to practice. Um, most provinces will have other groups like the OVMA or the CVMA, which help us in a practicing and running our businesses. So we all need to understand that, that the rules that these groups create are there to protect you and that they can be as much of a challenge for us as they are for you. Um, one of the things that the College of Veterinarians of Ontario ensures is that every facility is capable of providing an expected level of care that the public perceives veterinarians to have. They want to make sure that veterinarians can meet that level of expectation with their knowledge and also that they are giving a uniform standard of care or above and that protects you in making sure that you're not taken advantage of by someone. It is certainly not a perfect system, but please remember when you're speaking with your provincial association or a veterinarian who's trying to help you, that in the end, it is really about protecting your interests. The most significant barrier that is created by provincial associations is needless to say is cost. Equipment costs and the expected level of care that's mandated by our veterinary associations um, is a really big influence on this. But as well, realize that there are also rules regarding what ancillary staff, like technicians, can and can't do. There are rules about who can own and operate a clinic. There are mountains of rules about record, creepy, record keeping and drug control. And as well, there is a massive tangle of rules associated with advertising. Location can also be affected by the rules. I'm not aware of other associations, but I know in Ontario that we do not have an accreditation for mobile surgery yet in Ontario. That's something that we kind of need to work on here, and that's probably um, something that other groups are facing as well. In Ontario, we have two classifications if you're looking at the clinics. Um, and getting into the lingo, there's uh, the Companion Animal Hospital and the Spay Neuter Clinic. And these are very different little beasts, and there are pros and cons to both types if you're looking at putting one in. I know in Kitchener here we had quite a discussion about whether we would have a spay-neuter clinic or whether we would have a companion animal hospital. The companion animal hospital is, um, has no limits to procedures. It's more inclusive to care, but it's very expensive to set up and operate. However, it's this class you will need to be able to offer other types of surgery, dental care, or any any kind of medical services to the animals that you want to tend to care for. Spay-neuter clinic accreditation is cheaper um, to start up and it's less to maintain and mostly this is because there are a lot less pharmacy requirements and there are no diagnostic equipment like x-rays and dental equipment and blood machines um, in this class and this is the reason that we can offer um, the services at a lower price. However, you may find that your hands are tied when you try to offer any other kind of services from this facility if you're trying to help a shelter or a rescue group. Um, the uh, Companion Animal Hospital, you have to remember when you're, when you're discussing price comparison with a veterinarian in your area, you may get very different prices from a Companion Animal Hospital compared to a spay neuter clinic. And we need to always keep in mind the Companion Animal Hospital funding a very large budget to have all of that diagnostic equipment there. And in order to keep diagnostic expenses for sick animals lower, often clinics will pad up other routine processes a, a little bit more so that they're able to help people when they're really struggling in need with a sick animal. So there's a little bit of a balance there you need to keep in mind. Finally, when it comes to um, the provincial regulations, this is something I'm sure most of you have never heard, but all veterinarians live in fear of their provincial groups in terms of complaints and disciplinary action. And that these groups can take our licenses away from us if they don't think that we've done something right. It's a very complicated and time-consuming procedure. Uh, suspensions of license happen regularly. They're happening more and more often. And it's not just about losing your license for a few months. When you're put through this process, you lose your entire reputation. And so this is a barrier that many have, veterinarians have in volunteering their time because it's a risk we're not willing to take. This is especially going to be true if a veterinarian is asked to compromise the care that they're giving in the name of trying to get through a large volume or to do it at a cheaper price. And it doesn't matter whether it's paid work, whether it's volunteering, or whether it's offering you a discounted service at their clinic. 
This threat of disciplinary action for doing not approved work is becoming a real problem for us. Veterinarians essentially, they don't want to cut corners and have something go wrong because then they're going to face their career being ruined and that was to help us. So I know that this seems a little excessive, but I hope that it helps you understand where some of us might be coming from when our backs kind of prickle up when things are suggested because we really do worry about this. It's a bit of an obsession even with some veterinarians to make sure that they do everything right. <clears throat> so at this point I thought we would look at some of the barriers to accessibility that come through um, lack of veterinary support for you. And speaking as a veterinarian who's been in practice for 20 years and, and the fact that I think accessible means providing service for someone not in a place to acquire their own services and that this is a, you know, this is a socioeconomic problem for us in Ontario. Northern Ontario, I'm not going to speak as much for them because that's a different place. When you get north of Sudbury, the world becomes foreign to me. Um, there's definitely a lot more socioeconomic problem in the north, but there's also a distinct lack of veterinarians who are willing to practice in the northern communities. In southern Ontario, however, it's a different game. There are more than enough veterinarians and clinics in southern Ontario to provide the services that are required in this area. In fact, at some point, there are too many. So offering um, uh, open availability bay neuter clinics where you open the door and let anybody who wants to come in and receive that lower cost or subsidized bay neuter that's what really alienates many of the veterinarians and the communities that these are set up in. And this is why sometimes there is such a bridge that needs to be spanned between the groups. Many veterinarians see a spay-neuter clinic that's been subsidized or funded as unfair competition um, as the subsidies and donations are being used to lower the price and take business away from their clinics. So keep those things in mind. You know that veterinarians have big hearts. That's what it takes to be a veterinarian by nature. So why don't they want to help you more? I think this is a really common question that a lot of you are asking. I encourage you to think for a minute that some veterinarians may be overwhelmed with their own issues of business and family. You don't really know the financial situation of the clinic you are asking for for help. It may look all shiny on the outside, but inside it may not be what it seems. Veterinarians may already be helping in ways that you don't see or know about. For example, in Ontario, many veterinarians feel they're already helping underprivileged people by supporting the Farley Foundation, which is a, a nonprofit group that um, provides emergency funds for animals that need emergency veterinary care from owners, again, that are means tested and show a need for assistance. And I promise you, pro bono work, which is free work, and discounts are being offered all across the country to people who need them by veterinarians in every city all across this province and country. And we just aren't very good at waving our own flags. We like to help out. So remember those things when you're talking to your veterinarian and they, they kind of don't seem like they have interest. We recognize your passion. Um, understand that ours might already be somewhere and, and then maybe there's other ways we can help you. I often think rescue groups and veterinarians are from different worlds and I really found that in the year that I've been working for Kitchener. And I wondered why that was. Um, but it's really not hard to see why veterinarians in rescue groups and shelters don't see it in the same world. And that's because people who come to our clinics can afford veterinary care. Sorry, Kathy's having a phone call. Um, is everyone's phone on silent? Um, it's, uh, so people who come to our clinics, they can afford vet care and they know its importance. And if they're not financially stable, they're at least really trying to do their best and that's often where we help them out. Rescues and shelters, however, they see the estimated 45% of cats and 19% of dogs, and that's an AVMA study from the States in 2012. Those animals never come to the veterinarian, and these are the animals that veterinarians don't see. We don't really even know they exist, and it's not until you really get involved in a shelter that you start to see how many animals are really out there. And I think this disconnect us being really busy in our little world and you being busy in your, little, um, your own world, that prevents us from connecting on something that is a real issue that perhaps we could find more of a connection with. I really never, personally, I will tell you for 20 years, I never appreciated the real problem of feline overpopulation and the lack of accessibility and how accessibility, what it meant to have accessible services until I went to a presentation 
on cattle population by the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies. And I'll tell you, it was eye-opening. So think about that, that I could be so moved as to change my entire course of practice by a presentation. So it's really important how you present your case for accessibility to your um, community veterinarians, and this can make or break the deal. And here I'm going to give you a big tip. Veterinarians love science and research. And while it's really important that you show us your hearts and you show us how much you care, really come with the numbers ready. And in that, I'm going to just go over a few tips. Having had a lot of groups approach me in 20 years, how did Kitchener-Waterloo win me over to help out not only in Stratford but to jump on board here? And one of the most important things is to really clearly define your goals and provide lots of detail and data about what your community's actual need is to the veterinarians when you're talking to them. I'm really going to ask you, when you're opening a spay neuter clinic within your community, whether it's perceived or real competition, you are affecting a small business in your community. And it's kind of like, feels like to us like Walmart opening in a small town and how that affects all the other businesses. So that's a funny analogy, but I think it's a very real one. When you talk to a veterinarian about how they might help you, try to keep your proposal in a business model format. And please, emphasize what you personally are contributing or your group is contributing to that need, instead of making it seem like you're asking the veterinarian to take on your burdens. Um, I know you're not asking them that, but I encourage you to make sure that they understand what else you're contributing. Um, you need to understand that veterinary work is a hands-on kind of work. If the veterinarian is not doing something with their hands that generates revenue for their clinic, then they're out that money. So every time they volunteer, it is like they've just written you a check for money out of their pocket uh, because that's taken up their hands and their surgery tables to help you out. Finally, I would say uh, don't keep asking for more and more, and that's a bit of a whiny statement, but it's a complaint I hear often from veterinarians. When you come to a veterinarian, stick to a clear plan. I would really love it if you could do 20 space for us. That would be so much nicer than finding out that once I agree to do a few space, you have 75 that you need done in the next month. So have a clear plan, lay out what you're asking, complete that task, say thank you, and then you'll have created a friend that you can approach for the next task. So I hope that those uh, little tips help you when you're talking to your veterinarian. And uh, remember that even the harvest of us, because believe me, I was one of them, can be converted. And once a veterinarian has a positive experience in making an impact, I guarantee you they will be hooked and will be on your team for the rest of their career. Because in the end, we are all concerned about the same thing, and that's the animal's welfare. So after my whining as a veterinarian, I'm going to move on to more fun and uh, talk about um, what we do when we're talking about accessible um, spay neuters. And there's kind of two models that um, are, are, are or words even that are used when we're talking about this. And a low-cost model, often people will say it's a low-cost spay and neuter clinic, it kind of suggests something, doesn't it? It kind of like a no-name brand, where you should have a big yellow storefront or something. But what it also suggests is you're cutting corners somewhere in the care, because we all know that low-cost means I've cut something. And as a veterinarian, I can tell you, if you think you've got a low-cost model, it is impossible to do good surgical work for a low cost. Something is had to give to get to that. You might be using a substandard anesthetic protocol. You might think you're using cheaper surgery materials. You might not be using all brand new packs and autoclavable materials. And as well, a lot of groups are using veterinarians who are, I'm going to use little air quotes here, gaining experience through your group. And while this may be useful, I do encourage you to think about the pros and cons of what your real savings are when you are working in this type of format. Because remember, what you're paying for is what you get, and that's a very true statement. Most veterinarians are going to be much more amenable to the approach of offering to do high-quality, high-volume work. And um, this is where we're interested. Our ears will perk up. It helps us run our own clinics. Efficiency is kind of a new concept to veterinarians. We've always had uh, you know, the James Harriet kind of approach where we work on one animal at a time. We deal with its problems. We're helping its owners. Um, a very individualized kind of care. And this is what the clients in our clinics are paying for, so that's what we're very good at. 
in a high quality, high volume setting, animals are managed as a group. And there's really a lot less disruption to the day. There's a real team focus on getting the animals through. And animals are really organized by, uh, by, their, by their need and their group, and they're slotted rather than that individual, you were here first, so I'm going to give you the first kind of appointment need. Um, in this model, the work is done really quickly, but it's still done properly. And when you do these things, um, outcomes are better and the overall reputation of your group in the community, both with the public and your community veterinarians, is going to be better. And when you have a better reputation, that's going to lead to more support of your goals. So really watch how you're promoting yourself. Are you a low-cost chief clinic? Or are you doing really good work and you're able to handle a high volume because you're doing it with efficiency? So how do you create efficiency? You'll see here in the, the picture on the left there, this is what they call a beach technique. And all these cats came from the same litter. And they were all neutered at once, basically in a line. And um, that's something you will never see in a clinic that's a private practice. However, for us, this system works phenomenally well. And, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about how, how do you create this kind of situation um, and create this efficiency. I was a non-believer that it was possible. I kind of shrugged my shoulders when I heard about spay neuter clinics and how fast they could do things. And then I started working with Kitchener looking into things and realized it can be done, it's very efficient, and I've been fortunate to be able to take what I've learned here back to my private practice, which I'm still a co-owner in, and we've improved our efficiency in our clinic dramatically through what I've learned here. Um, so it is a two-way street that you can help each other. The first thing you need to start with is your staff, and you have to choose your staff very wisely. And you hire people based on their experience, and also strong, and I mean strong, organizational skills. In the low-cost model, you often have volunteer people helping you, and the learning environment in this takes a lot of time to get through things, and it can lead to complications because things may not get done right or things may get missed. A strong, skilled team moves through surgery really quickly and really efficiently, and when you're budgeting for, um, for this, you need to take into account that um, you need to hire the best staff to get the work done well and quickly. And for example, I find that uh, the, the team we have can do surgery on average three to four times faster than a clinic team because we're able to have this efficiency and team-oriented approach. Um, and that's a, that's a lot of savings. So um, think about when you're talking about setting up a clinic or um, starting a spay neuter clinic or even speaking with another veterinarian that there are ways that um, you can do this, and most groups that are running a spay neuter clinic that is high volume, high quality, are very, very happy to share how they're doing it. Some of the other things that we're working with here, um, we're constantly upgrading our protocols and charts, um, and we do this so that we can have really rapid information collection, because our provincial association requires enormous amounts of paperwork every time we touch an animal. And um, so you want to have all of these things in place. You want to make it really fast, really rapid. Kind of the same thing that happens when you're taking animals. If you're um, using a veterinary clinic, it, the more you can have ready for them and be prepared for them, the easier it is for them to flow through. Try to organize so that you can take many cats on one day instead of one cat a day. And that creates efficiency, and the clinics will see that um, in the outcome. It's also really important to have a really quick, non-stressful, anesthesia for the animals in surgery in a low, uh, high quality, high volume, you only want to have to touch these animals once. And that's not a standard veterinary protocol. Um, experienced staff is really important. And uh, not um, you don't want to scrimp on your drugs in this situation. We use a drug here called Dextomator. Kathy knows it's more expensive than a lot of the other drugs that we can use. However, it's wonderful to have an animal care manager who actually grasps the concept that I can use a drug that's a bit more expensive if I only have to touch the cat once versus something cheaper that takes me 20 minutes of wrestling and five injections. So when you're thinking about um, protocols and uh, ways that you're going to do surgery, then there are lots of really quick, efficient ways that are very well accepted and also very, very, very safe. Finally, as a last moment, I veterinarian, I can't help but comment that pain control is the most important part of any kind of um, spay-neuter program. 
and we simply can never compromise what we're giving to these animals for pain control um, post-surgically, intrasurgically, um, in the in the interest of making things go faster and in the interest of keeping things cheaper. Successful spay neuter clinics are popping up all over Ontario. I'm sure they're popping up all over Canada, definitely the U.S. It's a really new model of clinic. Most veterinarians aren't familiar with it. They're threatened by it. But it's something that we're all going to have to get used to. And if we all approach each other and understanding where we're all coming from, and that's through sharing knowledge that we think we can all work together better. And I think Kitchener already has been a great example of how um, I've been converted into a shelter veterinarian and, and absolutely love it. And I think you'll find that experience in, in your uh, communities as well. So I think that the questions are going to be coming now. That's great. Thank you both so much. So Hillary is going to uh, read out some of the questions that we have from the participants. All right, great. So we have one question to begin. Uh, just a reminder that if you do have a question, you're welcome to enter it into the question box, and I'll read it out. Um, so we do have one question. When we look at accessible spay neuter in remote or underserviced areas, where cultural differences are also often a factor, non-surgical procedures seem to hold the most hope for sustainable solutions. I wonder if Dr. Steely could speak to the feasibility of seeing calcium chloride added as a viable approved neutering option. Well, um, most veterinarians in Ontario are going to shrug their shoulders at you and go, what are you talking about? Because we really don't have a lot of access to any other techniques in Ontario, um, Canada, meaning that there's not a lot of readily licensed drugs. Um, I think that for my interest, um, one of the biggest challenges with alternate methods of preventing reproduction is that it's not a long-term solution. Um, most of the medications that I have seen that are currently being licensed in Canada require you to give that animal that medication every year, if not every day, to keep them from being reproductively active. Um, and that's um, something that uh, I don't think that goes along with the philosophy of a shelter, which is to make sure these animals never re-enter the reproductive cycle. Um, so there is, to my best of my knowledge, there isn't some permanent way to sterilize animals um, at this time in Canada that is uh, um, legal, <laughs> I'm going to say. Um, and uh, veterinarians are always interested in exploring new things, but as I mentioned, provincial regulations um, really tie our hands. Um, I'm already twisting a few rules in how we do things. I'm sure every senior clinic is. Um, and uh, I think that the drug companies are going to have to bring these products more into light for us, for us to feel comfortable with them. And uh, we're going to have to get approval by our provincial associations. But I'm not sure that it's the right solution for long-term control of reproduction in these animals. Thank you. So we have one more question. Um, do you chip your TNRs? Do you offer shelter building at KW? There is TNR training available. Do you have recovery space for TNRs? Uh, we work very closely with the, the rescue organizations. Um, they have all those things set up within their organizations and within their uh, volunteer foster network. So um, the way we work with them here is um, we do not microchip um, the, the uh, feral cats. Now, there are some cats that do come in through the TNR program that they are placing in homes. Those cats, um, they rehabilitate and uh, manage to bring them around so that they can be adopted. And we do microchip them. Um, uh, we have looked at and has been brought up in discussions about having a recovery area here on site. Um, at this point, um, it still is just in the discussion phase. I'm not sure if it will come to fruition because I, I believe um, they do it well. TNR has, they have the background. They know what they're doing. Um, they've been doing it for a number of years. So um, right now, everything seems to be working well for us. Um, and honestly, as far as, and I'm sure many humane sites can appreciate this as well, space is a commodity, usually is. So um, yeah, that would be one of our barriers for sure. But right now, we're kind of leaving that in their hands, and it seems to be working well. We do uh, put a, um, we do ear tip if we don't microchip. Um, I, I've had in problems in the past recognizing ear tips in cats that are outdoor because of severe frostbite in the last few winters. I'm sure everyone can appreciate that. 
Um, so one of the other things that we are doing is that every cat that comes through the feral program um, is marked near its spay line with um, a small green tattoo. And that says to any veterinarian who would get that cat onto a table before they would open it, they would say, whoa, there's a mark here. And that would mean um, that that mark is kind of a, being universally accepted as a mark that a feral program has spayed the cat. And we also put that mark even when we neuter them because uh, we don't want people to assume that maybe, especially when we do some of them quite young, that they were just retained cats. Um, and we actually put that on the belly as well so that if the belly was shaved for somebody to go in and start hunting for the little boy parts, they would see the green mark. So they are marked that they have been done. And uh, hopefully between the ear tip or the microchip, then they are able to be identified as that. Thank you. So the next question is, can pro bono veterinary services be considered an in-kind donation in terms of charitable tax receiving? No, unfortunately my accountant tells me that it's not. Um, that it's not something that we can do. Uh, I asked that a long time ago. And it, it uh, because it's a technicality that if you do pro bono work, you have to bill the pro bono work, and then that shows as income, and then you get the receipt to write off the income. So it doesn't really act as a, as a true donation of just giving dollars away. Um, that, that that's how it works. What do you think is the best way to ask someone to prove they are low income? Well, I think here uh, we're going to be looking at, and I know a lot of uh, Hamilton, Burlington does this, and as I mentioned, Regina. So uh, a T4 slip or some uh, government slips that prove they're on social assistance or whatnot um, will be what we'll utilize. Um, I haven't heard of anything other than that at this point that people utilize for that to prove income. Um, so we're going to see how that works for us. Does KW Humane have a step-down area which is quieter for the cats and dogs to recover, or are they returned to their kennel or cage? No, actually, because um, the, the Kitchener Water Humane Society, and sorry we didn't mention that, we have a full companion animal hospital certification. So our clinic, it looks exactly like a veterinary office set within the walls here. It's completely sealed off. It's actually locked off. Um, the only thing we're missing is, an, is a receptionist sitting at a front desk, although the Humane Society has two lovely women up front. Um, so we actually have full kennels, um, and all animals are recovered in kennels. And um, they, uh, we don't send them back to their shelter cages until they are fully awake and able to stand. We often will leave them in the cages overnight with their blankets and their warming bottles until the morning if we don't get to them until a bit later. And then they're transferred back to their kennels in the morning. And another question. When cats are spay-neutered on-site at KW, is there a higher incidence of URI? Um, there is a much higher incidence of upper respiratory infection because they're shelter cats. Um, I don't, I personally don't see, um, working with the, the Stratford shelter, which is much smaller, they send their sprays and neuters out. And Kitchener, we do all of them here. Both the groups have had issues, of course, with upper respiratory. Um, I think that there's pros and cons to both. I'm not sure that there is any con to having them done in here that would increase their risk. You certainly have to be very sterile between cats. Um, we um, will often rank our day. As I mentioned, you know, in a spay-neuter clinic, we, we do it by need, not by who's first in the door. So respiratory cats, if they're a little snuffly, will get left till later. Sometimes they'll get isolated in the dog ward if there's no dogs in it. Um, to keep them away from the other cats. There has to be very thorough sterilization of the anesthetic equipment, of masks, and all those things has to go on every day. The problem with sending them out to a clinic, I, I think respiratory is worse because um, these cats are stressed by throwing them in a kennel, transporting them to a clinic. Often at those clinics, they're left in their cages until they're touched. They get put back in those cages when they're done, regardless of whether they're awake or not because people are there to pick them up. Um, and I think it puts them at a huge risk um, at my clinic. It would be lovely to think that I never see a sick cat at my clinic, but that's not true. And I think that you can put the shelter cats at risk by exposing them to the larger general population and vice versa. So I definitely think the risk of upper respiratory is less having an in-house clinic um, that does the spaying and neutering. Um, to kind of take it in a different direction, if you're asking, Spaying and neutering will cause a recurrence of a cat that is carrying herpes. 
For sure. It's very common for a cat, and it's almost to the nine, five days after their spay or neuter, to redevelop an upper respiratory infection. Um, and that's a challenge that we face um, on a regular basis in both shelters. Thank you. So there's one more question. Uh, what is the annual budget of your veterinary component? Uh, uh, I, I, I kind of want to say that's a shifting entity, but um, we're looking at, for next year, we're looking at uh, close with uh, salaries and, and uh, medications and everything it takes for us to do what we need to do for the animals here at approximately uh, $430,000. So that's our two, uh, 2015 budget. Um, now keep in mind we are including our TNR in there on our Wednesdays, and uh, that will be subsidized, as I mentioned, uh, by a donor for the next 12 months. Okay, so I'll just give everyone another moment or two if they have any last questions that they'd like to ask. But it looks like that might be it for today. Um, so just a reminder that we have recorded the webinar and it will be available on our website um, afterwards. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Steely and Ms. Innocente very much for this uh, very insightful presentation. Um, I wanted to mention that a lot of the um, a lot of the content from this presentation really struck home with me as being practical applications of the work that we're describing on the Accessible Stay Neuter Project. So. Um, there was some discussion about doing an assessment of your community's needs to figure out um, what actually needs to happen in your geographic area and identifying partnerships. So there's a tool on our page that's all about community needs assessment and figuring out, uh, helping people, hopefully the tool will help people to do that kind of an assessment. And I love some of the uh, guidance that was presented on choosing partners and identifying who and how to work with them. Um, I also really loved the discussion on accessible, like what is it that the whole Accessible Stay Neuter project is about. So thank you so much for that. And it was wonderful to have a veterinary perspective in this presentation. So um, I think it's a, a wonderful way to close off our Accessible Stay Neuter 2014 project. Um, hopefully we'll continue to add more resources um, as they become available, but uh, given that we're closing off the year, feel free to check back on the Accessible Stay Neuter page for, for updates and certainly for the recording. Um, and we're also hoping that the, the PowerPoint will be available as well. So without uh, anything further, I know we're a little bit over time, but I think it was well worth it to hear from this presentation. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I'll also take the opportunity to wish everybody uh, a very happy holiday. So thanks very much. And thanks again, Kathy and Leanne. You're very welcome. OK, bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>